A new documentary is uh, releasing in Australia on the 1st of December, a documentary called Enough, Lebanon's Darkest Hour. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer-director of this uh, film, Daisy Kedian. Daisy, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be on your show. Okay, great. I'll just get you to speak up a little bit more. But this is okay. such a... This is such a, an, an angry documentary in many ways about what's happened in Le Lebanon, obviously with the uh, explosion at the Beirut port, but also with the issue of politics, corruption, uh, economic crisis. There's a whole range of issues that uh, are facing mm -hmm. Lebanon. How did it come about? Because your background is in journalism. Uh, Daisy, uh, how did it come about that you wanted to make a film about all this? calling it the film about the violence of Lebanon when I went, went, first went back in 2017, having been on the end of the civil war in, 20, in 1990, there had been improvement and growth and reconstruction development. But on that first film trip in 2017, um, you know, spending six weeks or so with people around the country, I realized that I was um, really barking up the wrong tree. I was, you know, the reality was on the face of it, the facade of Lebanon, it seemed to be improving. But in reality, the people had this weight and this heaviness and this heart, the, the hardness of their life was coming through. And it, it made me think, step back and ask deeper questions um, and, and want to explore why. And those deeper questions took me to find out the hardship of their life. It was becoming, even though you'll see in the film 2017, when you see the film, there's still life and there's parties and there's nightclubs and there's restaurants and, and it's vibing like any European capital in the world. And it's the best, you know, like CNN, a travel team had called it the third best city in the world to to visit uh, night night you know nightlife in the world, uh, but the reality was that the average person's life was extremely difficult, and so as as I moved deeper into the country, into the south, into the villages, and you know across the country, uh, the hardship began to manifest, and and people were willing to be more open about it, but not showed they expressed difficulty were not scared to name names or still had the smile, smile brain with the masks that we put on. Uh, and so it, it was that initiation in 2017 that forced me to explore deeper and come back again in 2018 for a second uh, trip and explore the elections because I thought 2018 elections it's the first time that they had had elections in nine years and I thought if they were really suffering they would make their voices heard through the ballot box yeah. you know and I was really hoping for change in 2018, but um, it didn't happen. Um, and that's that's what led us into this pathway into revolution in 2019, where they the people finally rejected uh, their leaders um, and into, you know, unfortunately the revolution had incredible community solidarity across the entire country. You couldn't, you, you, you know, it hadn't been seen since the assassination of Rafiq Kariri in 2005. And this was even bigger than that because it was universal across the country and across the world that um, uh, the Lebanese united against their leaders. And unfortunately COVID um, ended that sort of unification because they couldn't, they couldn't unite. Um, up until uh, I'm going on, tell me when to stop because I'm. it came to that point where you asked me about the anger and that final anger came with the explosion that that point of the explosion in 2000 in, in you know 2020 august 4 2020 
was when the gloves really came off and that final, you know, fierceness of this is it, you know, enough. Um, we're not putting up with it and I'm not going to even contemplate any um, opportunity of giving them the benefit of the doubt. You know, as a journalist, you, you should give people the benefit of the doubt and you go into interviews with that and I, all my interviews were very impartial but um, it was that that uh, the that criminal negligence to allow something like that to happen um, meant that these people were completely incompetent and and there was something mentally wrong with them to have over over um, overlooked something so so serious as that and allow it to happen. It's an incredible story and. Uh... Uh, and, and it's great that you're able to reveal it all. And, and what impressed me, amongst a number of other things, is the interviews that you were able to, uh, to garner with uh, you know, prime ministers and, and a whole range of officials, as well as everyday people and their responses. How much of that was easy to organise and how much of that was uh, quite a challenge for you? Peter, it was um, the big ones were extremely difficult. Like with uh, the prime minister, former prime minister Saad Hariri, it took eighteen months, and people, people are the ones that opened the door in the end. They, it took relationships. Um, same with the Hezbollah minister Mohammed Ghanesh. That was over and over and over again, requesting, 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 and then finally, a minister I'd interviewed, um, her PA made the connection with the minister's PA and they made it happen. But that was the first interview in 12 years that Hezbollah had given to a Western journalist. So I didn't realise that until I was walking into the interview with um, the minister and she said to me, you know, this is the first time that uh, Hezbollah has approved a, an interview with a Western journalist in, in 12 years, you know. Um, and so most of them... You know, most of the big ones, like Gibran Basile, the former foreign minister, who is now the leader of the Free Patriotic Movement, who I interviewed twice. I interviewed him once in his offices. He gave me 20 minutes. I had, a, a you know, extended it to 30 minutes. But um, then I did a doorstop with him when he could come to Sydney um, and grabbed another. I got The assistant gave me three questions. That's all I had to ask him. But he, he gave me the dirt in those three questions which was wow you know um sometimes it's better to make it brief but uh yeah like dr jaja the uh, leader of the lebanese forces um i had previously interviewed him in my first documentary 25 years ago and accessing him it took a little bit of convincing but wasn't as difficult we had some history he knew who i was i had um some legacy there and so it wasn't as difficult and i think um he is also a man who understands the importance of media and publicity and, and expressing himself. And I, I think he wanted to benefit from that too. And, um, um, you know, the, the, the others, some of them were easier, but really it took, it really took people opening the doors for us, knocking on doors for us and, and, and giving us that, um, that, that vouch of uh, approval that until we, that's the only way really we got them. <laughs> well, well done on that, because that, that's really such an important part of your yeah. film. Uh, I'm always intrigued about getting films produced and getting financing and so on. And especially as you travel to a number of countries to uh, talk to the Lebanese diaspora. Um, tell me yeah. about that process. Uh, how easy was it to get funding and to structure the documentary around all that? Well, it's never easy to get funding ever, 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 ever. So, um, you know, you have to really be committed. Um, and so, look, in the beginning, fortunately, I had some money put away that I could begin the process to, to test the validity of it. Um, and that was, you know, so the first trip was on my back um, in 2017. And then we came back and realised there was a real story here and applied to a Screen Australia through the, you know, producer offset equity, put on a producer to help me with doing all of that. And the government is, you know, we, we're very lucky to live in Australia, that we have a system that recognises art. And I know back in the days, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 
it was a much better system and there was much more support for filmmakers. Uh, fortunately, there's still some support and I, you know, encourage the government and, and um, you know, independent business to really support the arts. It's, it's the most, you know, important form of expression to find those stories and bring them to life um, through the vision, vision, the medium of, um, you know, film. It's such a compelling manner of, of media channel to deliver through your, your message. Um, so for me, you know, it was um, it was through that sort of uh, beginning uh, funding it, and I had to still fund a lot of it myself. Uh, but I did have uh, we did you know go out to the Lebanese community, go out to businesses to try and get grants. And when you you know you've got to do that, you've got to have a a, a legitimate proposition. And I think it forces you to think about your project as a business too. And, and as there's a real business case for the story um, in that there's an audience for it. You know, you can't just make a story just for the whim of it. I mean, it'd be nice to do that sort of stuff, but there, you know, money is, is valuable. And so it has to be thought through. It just allows the filmmaker, the producer, the di you know, director, whoever's the inspiration behind it to really document why they're making it and how valuable that is to the audience and then that helps you really structure your 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 story so um you know so we're we've uh, secured the 20 percent producer offset once the film gets um into cinemas uh you know and gets a, pro a proper theatrical release we'll be um in line for that 40 percent producer offset which will really help because it um it does make a difference to you know whether my bank loan against my house <laughs> continues to be take me years to pay off or not. So I'm very uh, hopeful that that will come through because we're launching in you know a couple of weeks and hopefully the theatrical release will demonstrate its validity to the audience. Oh, I'm sure it will. And fortunately, cinemas are open everywhere, so we, which is great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, and, and, and with all the material that you shot, obviously you have so many interviews and uh, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. How did you make decisions about the editing process and what you left in and what you took out? Well, uh, that's a great question because, you know, you have so much and there's so many ways to tell the story. It's... Um, it, it, and I did. I started the. I started the script so many different ways. It's. It was. You know, just waiting for it to happen, and and you just have to test yourself. You know, and then test if it's going to continue. Does that feel right? Because really, it's an intuitive thing. You know, that you're writing, and you, and then it becomes more apparent that this is the right way because it leads. It suddenly unfolds. You know. Um, that's after you've digested all of the information. You know, you've got, I, I, the way I work is that I have to you know, write and undertake the interviews, then read everything and digest it. I'm, I'm one that has to consume and allow it to, to formulate in my nervous system and my brain. And then it just sort of starts telling itself. Um, so as you were asking, like, how do you know? It really, I had so much material and really it was a three hour film that I had to cut down to an hour and a half and it took a while, but you know what, in the end, and you know, you're, you're holding on to each bit. No, 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 there's a reason for that. And it's so important and I've got to keep that because that means that, and, you know, in the end, you really rely on people who are, have a, you know, a distance from it because, they tell you whether it's okay, whether the story still makes sense when you take that out, because you think that everyone needs to know everything. And so I had some great consultants on, on board and with the script and, you know, who kept that arm's length distance because then they could look at it and re with re re fresh eyes and say, no, you know, you know what, I still get it. Even when you take that, I still make the connection so it's okay. So, and I'm, you know, someone asked me that this morning, I was on an interview this morning and, and, I, and they said, were you satisfied with the product that, you know, the end product? And I said, in the end, I, you know, I had to cut down quite a lot, but my role was to ensure that the message that the most important message was delivered to the audience. 
And that from that story that I tell and the message that's being conveyed, they have enough, enough information to draw the right conclusions or draw their conclusions, and then they can follow through. But I needed to give them enough evidence and fact to ensure that they had the foundations to make the right decisions as they, about the country, about the people, about the leaders, and how they could impart, uh, impact change if, if that was what they wanted to do. So, you know, it, it was a long process, honestly. I, I can't tell you how many times I rewrote it. I can imagine. <laughs> I speak to many filmmakers and it's exactly the same with uh, editing a documentary. It's never an easy process. Uh, um, and uh, it, it's interesting too, you've, you've put some music into, into the film uh, and, and uh, some excellent archival and news footage, etc., which in fact leads off the film. We go straight into the, uh, the Beirut port explosion. So getting that uh, material and putting the music in there, uh, that must have been a challenge for you as well. Well, the, on the music, um, when I was writing it, I had to... I, uh, music really motivates me and I love music in films, whether they're documentaries or features or whatever. Music is, it touches me. So I would put on, you know, John Williams, different pieces of John Williams and I would be, it would help me get in the mood of, of, of the different um, themes or er sections of the film. And I always believed it needed a big score. So I, um, you know, was hoping that I would, God would manifest a great composer for me. So, and he did, you know, through um, one of my pr producers made contact with a great composer and, and concert pianist in Lebanon, who's was a child prodigy at the age of 11, 12, doing concerts at Albert Hall and, you know, Carnegie Hall and a tremendous um, lover of, of, of sound and, and music. So, um, and, you know, I, I thought, you know, we had a small budget assigned for music and we thought, you know, look, we've only got this amount and it, you know, it, it just blew because he was as big a thinker and visionary as me. And it was like, uh, um, you know, it went from a $20,000 budget to a $200,000 budget and I had to find the money. It was crazy um, to think about it, but he said, I can hear the orchestra and I can, we, we um, secured the Kiev Philharmonic Orchestra. This is in the middle of COVID, you know, when you didn't have orchestras playing. Uh, but in Kiev, he could, he had worked with the, the, um, the Kiev Philharmonic o Orchestra and they were ready to work with him again. And so we had an 83 piece uh, orchestra that, that you know, that, that produced the music. Um, and it sounds amazing. It really is a beautiful score. And I, I actually, I get very emotional listening to it. And I really am grateful that I did that. I mean, look, at the end of the day, it costs a lot of money and some people can't do what I did because they can't mortgage their house. They can't get loans and stuff. But, I, you know, for me, I said to my kids, you know, Money has to have a purpose in life. And um, and this is such an important story and I wanna give it everything it deserves. And um, at the end of the day, it might be the last thing I do for Lebanon. And I wanna make sure that I make it the best way that I can and give it everything that I, I it deserves to, to appeal, you know, to appeal to the broadest audience and the widest audience around the world. Um, in, in any way and that the story is received uh, in the way it should be. So, you know, not every documentary maker can do that. And um, I put a lot of stuff on the line. I, I took a huge amount of risk and, you know, t it's that important to me. So, um, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the story of the music. And I forgot the second part of the question was the, um, sorry, that's okay. But, um, I mean, I mean, it's it's clearly a passionate project for you, and uh, and I suppose the the whole issue of film as an agent of change, you're hoping that I suppose in particular, if the film screens in Lebanon, uh, and the government uh, and the leaders see it, as well as the people, of course, um, that 
there will be some change, especially, for example, uh, I mean, the sectarianism uh, you can't avoid because there's so many different culture, uh, uh, religions and cultures and so on in Lebanon, as well as other Middle Eastern countries. But also the notion that I didn't see any females or any women at all in leadership positions in Lebanon. It's true. I mean, you've got a couple of women in parliament, but they're not leaders, mm. you know. And they don't have any um, any uh, power at all. You know, uh, we saw it when I was in Lebanon recently, just a couple of months ago. Um, one of the ministers who I'd interviewed, Dr. Enea Zadin, she stood up in Parliament uh, because we've got elections in Lebanon in the coming you know year, in probably six months, four to six months. She stood up in Parliament and and proposed a bill for the next elections that there be. Um, equal representation for women in parliament. She wasn't even up for five minutes when those men laughed her out of parliament. I mean, how ridiculously backward is that? Mm. They wouldn't even give her the dignity, pay her the respect and dignity to listen to her, um, you know, present her bill. They laughed her out and she just had to leave the leave the house. And it was astonishing. And this is not Lebanon. This is, we were liberal. We're a very liberal society. But the people that are in power don't want this sort of liberal thinking. They don't want any of that. They want to control it and manipulate the minds and keep the power in their hands. You know, you have, you have gratuitous representation of women of uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs now, but she's part of a party that's part of the problem, you know? So they do appoint people who are puppets, you know, they're, yep, they're gonna do them. They're their yes men. They're not independent individuals. So mm. it is a problem. Yes, that uh, issue of corruption uh, permeates your documentary and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, to hear stories that people don't have electricity for, uh, most part of the day, they uh, um, they don't have uh, good aspirations because uh, jobs are not there for them because the economy is in such a mess. Um, is there hope for Lebanon? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the only time hope fails or hope ends is when we give up. And you know, there are people who are giving up, and because they've been traumatized in their nervous system can't take it anymore and they're abandoning the country. You know, there's been approximately 160,000 people that have left the country for good in the last 12 months. You know, that's tragic, it's tragic. But, and I was in Ubers and cars and walking, you know, and seeing and speaking to those people. And so many people said, if I could leave tomorrow, I would leave tomorrow. And you can't deny them that because those people have put up with it for so long. Mm. They're, they can't, they're, they're just, exhausted so um you know but the reality is that we there there is hope and as we explore in the film the hope really is in the hands of the youth you know the 21 to 35 year olds who are a large percentage of the population at least 30 percent if not 35 percent of the population and these people these youth it's their future you know, it's their time to lead and their time to fight for their future. And they can do that easily by voting. Mm. Um, you know, they have an incredible influence over their parents too and relatives. And we've seen it already in the university elections over the last 12 months in Lebanon, where formerly the old parties would win, you know, the student body representations and different groups, but there's been a whitewash. It's almost been a landslide against them, which shows that there is shift, a massive shift in, in mindset in, amongst the youth that are still at university, that those are at university. So there's real hope um, that those people will change and will actually vote. We just need them to vote. You know, mm -hmm. we need them to vote. And the, the next question is, who are they going to vote for? The question that comes up is, well, who do I vote for? And a lot of people around the world with the film going around the world to different festivals are saying, well, who are they going to vote for? Who are the new parties? Who are the new candidates? And even to date, there's not a lot of candidates that have, um, that have announced. And a lot of it is because they don't want to announce prematurely 
and they don't want to be assassinated. Unfortunately, that's a reality. So um, they didn't want to get picked off early one after the other. And, I, and there's a, But there's a lot of work that's been going on behind the scenes in Lebanon since the October 2019 revolution started with groups behind the scenes building up political parties and deciding who's going to run and looking and, and preparing for that. So there definitely is that work that's been done on the on, under the ground and behind the scenes. And having had the opportunity to be there from after leaving Khan, where we, we picked up the award, we went to Beirut because we got locked out of Australia. So um, we were in Beirut. We did a lot of publicity interviews and, and um, and then I had the chance to go around and meet people and say, you know, who's standing, who's, who's, um, who are going to be the candidates, and they explained this to me. So, the candidates will announce in the next. More will announce. I think three or four have announced in different seats of, around the country, but I think uh, much more are preparing to announce in de December, January. But they're also being strategic because the government is playing silly buggers with the election dates. You know, they had it at May 8th, then they've made it March 27th. So we're not sure if it's March 27th because they've got another, they, they've got to decide in the next week, I think, or by the end of November what it firmly is. But there's an argument between the president and the, and the prime minister and the speaker of the house. Um, well, actually it's the president and the speaker of the house are having a fight and the prime minister's in the middle there. Um, so, the three of them have to decide, they have to agree. So that hasn't been achieved yet. So we're not sure, but, and a lot of people are saying they don't think the elections are gonna happen. Um, and I fear that they might be delayed, which is not the worst thing. It just gives people more time to prepare for them, but, um, and it'll give me much more time to get out with the film and let it, be exposed around the world, which will be wonderful for people's awareness. Uh, but I do believe that they have to have elections. I think the international community will, will demand that they have elections. Um, they might give them a leeway of a few months, but um, in, in Beirut, uh, we were, the Australian ambassador, Rebecca Grindley was very generous and hosted a wonderful screening, private screening for ambassadors in Beirut for us. And she invited the American ambassador, the UK, the Canadian, um, European, Swiss, we had Saudis, we had Egyptians, we had many different, but, but only about 20 of them. There was a select group and they were mostly the ones that were, had the most interest in Lebanon. And um, that was a very, critical uh, screening and you mentioned something about security before and after they saw the film quite a few of them came up to me and said um, do you have security <laughs> and I said no should I and they said well you know you're revealing stuff that we might be familiar with but the rest of the community isn't aware of and you're putting them up on a screen and I think you need to be careful. So I said, right. So um, I've had I've had that now a few times. So I, I'm not sure what to do with that, but I have to, my dad's very concerned about me ever going back and so are a few people um, when, when it actually gets released because they haven't seen it yet. It hasn't been released in Lebanon, only it's been screened to maybe 200 people privately in Lebanon, private screenings of people not in government, um, anti-establishment. So. Um, yes, so yeah, it's <laughs> not I sure think, what to do. Yeah, you're probably safer in Australia at the moment, I, I'd say, <laughs> because the, the film is quite searing and uh, it uh, it will uh, rub some people, I can imagine, up the wrong way in uh, higher circles mm -hmm. in uh, in Lebanon. And uh, <laughs> but yeah. it's but it's great to see that your film has already been given an award or you've received some awards, some acclaim already in overseas film festivals. Yes. So that, that shows that the film is already having an impact and will do so, especially in Australia from the 1st of December. Yes, I'm very, I'm very moved. Look, people don't put a lot of stock in festivals and awards and you know, it's not about the award. 
I say to them, it's not about winning an award. It's about that that is those people and those countries who are not Lebanese or those film festival directors said, this is a story of note that people should watch. And that is the value of having it in festivals because then you know that the, the message has legitimacy mm. and has a purpose. And I am very touched that it's been invited to 12 different festival festivals and won awards at, you know, three or four now, which is outstanding. And, um, and what it does is the award just puts a spotlight back on the topic of Lebanon and on the story of Lebanon, which never should be out of the spotlight. You know, it's like the, the Holocaust story. It should never be out of the spotlight. So we never, ever, you know, forget what happened. And any crisis, any disaster anywhere, you know, like we shouldn't forget those stories because they shouldn't be like a fad that that is that comes and goes. Those historical traumas are really things that we need to learn from as, you know, human beings and never ignore them. And, and, and what's going on in Lebanon, not just the explosion, the explosion really brought it home to people around the world, everywhere. Everyone knows the explosion, you know, everyone remembers the explosion. And then they started, it gave them a reason to explore the topic even more. And we've had a lot of um, journalists and, and media channels delving deeper in, but never to the extent that I did, because I spent five years on this and had been a Middle East sort of, buff and expert for, for 20 years before that, 25 years. So, you know, I did invest a great deal of time in it because it's, it is a personal passion project. And, but it's about truth and justice, you know, and it happens to be about Lebanon. And I've actually been, you know, uh, just since the DC screening, uh, I'll just tell you something new that's just developing that um, someone's asked me about working, you know, collaborating with them on a film about um, Israel and, and the Palestinians on a different theme because the story of the way I've approached this story about Lebanon is a similar way that they'd like to approach the story on the the people of you know the, that troubled nation too you know is the Jewish people and the Palestinian people have nearly had a hundred years of, of trauma and there needs to be resolution because that trauma is impacting the whole world um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's wonderful and reassuring to see that people are seeing that the way and the approach of this, this my story might be a way that they could approach t tenderly that story too. Uh -huh. so, that's, so that's going to be your next film, by the looks of it. <laughs> It could very well be, Peter, and you, you've got the scoop because I haven't, I haven't said, said anything. I actually got off the phone just before I jumped on to speak to you with speaking to people about it. They were like really keen to have a have a chat about it. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, congratulations on all that, Daisy. Last question I love asking all filmmakers. Were there any mm. particular films, uh, documentaries, whatever that inspired you or filmmakers that you look up to? Definitely. Michael Moore, I love him. Um, um, uh, 11, Fahrenheit 11.9, not 9.11. I don't know if you've seen the 11.9, Fahrenheit 11.9. Yep. Wonderful about Trump and Hillary and, and Flint, Michigan. And um, that inspired me. So did, um, uh, oh, oh, it's a Brazilian film that was a, a, a nominated for Academy Award last year. I keep saying it's... Um, uh, Oh, I forgot it now. It's something democracy that that was a wonderful film. It's a it, Brazilian. It's um, oh, the search for democracy or in search of democracy or something. The legacy of democracy. I think it's um mm -hmm. something like that. I just sorry, it's, my brain is so fried at the yeah. moment from being all over the world. But yeah. those two, I, I've watched so many documentaries and looking for that inspiration. Joshua, the the boy in Hong Kong, the sixteen year old, you know. Uh, revolutionary in Hong Kong who wanted to, you know, fight the Chinese about the the way that the Chinese were trying to impose uh, change the, the education system. He was wonderful um, as well. So I, I watched so much to get inspiration um, for Summer, the Syrian documentary that was also a nominee for a Academy Award. Um, I all of them 
help me guide the story in and you know in the way I told the story so uh, yeah they're, they're my inspirations and Lion for Lam Lions for Lambs the feature film with Robert Redford and Andrew Garfield I think it was a 2008 film um, Meryl Streep Tom Cruise I love that film and I love the role of Robert Redford trying to teach Andrew Garfield as a student um, you know, you've got to get involved, you know, because Andrew Garfield was this amazing student who just let it go and, and, and Robert Redford was his professor and he's wanting to have that conversation of why are you giving up? And he said, what difference does it make? You know, I'm just one person. What difference does my essay or my contribution make? And he was a real political, uh, strong political mind. And, and that's where we are today in the world. You know, that's what resonated so profoundly, like people are giving away their power, they're, they're abdicating responsibility, they're checking out, they're watching mindless TV, which you're allowed to do every now and then, but not 90, hour, 90 hours a week or whatever, and doing drugs, alcohol, whatever, like they're just giving away the life, their life. And I, you know, this stuff really inspired me and motivated me. So... <sighs> Wow. <laughs> Daisy, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, so enough Lebanon's darkest hour in Australian cinemas from December 1st. Go and see it. And it's been a pleasure talking to you, Daisy. Daisy Gideon, the director of the film. Thanks so much for talking with me. Thank you so much, Peter. It's been my absolute pleasure. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. See you.